Good morning. Welcome to River of Life Community Church. I'm so glad you tuned in today. We're on a four-part sermon series titled, I Know What This Is. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came to earth in the form of a baby to become God-man, to wipe away the sins of the world so that we could be reunited with God. Today's the third message in the series saying, randomly celebrated. God didn't randomly give us his son. It was at a specific time for a specific purpose. Our church has been changed by these three sermons. Today we're going to learn that God didn't ask us to settle. He didn't give us his son just so we could passively live a good life. No, we have a calling, we have an anointing as a Christian to go forward, to be aggressive with this message that we have in us. Christ in us, Emmanuel, hallelujah. What a gift it is. Open your Bibles, pull up a chair, call your neighbors and friends over and let's celebrate the birth of Jesus this season. Thank you for being a part of this worship today. Take your copy of God's Word this morning. Same text as last week. Let's stay standing this morning for the Word of God. Don't want to fall into any routines. I know you're used to sitting, so let's stay standing this season, though, for the reading of the Word. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38, and you can flip your thumb over to Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25 there also. Starting at Luke chapter 126, in the month, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. A virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, that's something we all would like to hear. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. That's typical response in the flesh. And the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? Legitimate question. This absolutely makes no sense to me, angel. And the angel answered her. Here's the answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold... And it, it's like she qualifies the power of God here. Here, I'll give you a little inside information. Remember your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Here, Mary. Here, here's a little positive note. Remember Aunt Elizabeth? She couldn't have any kids. Guess what? She's pregnant too. A little word of encouragement. Verse number 37. I love it. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, wow. No, I'm adding there. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Matthew chapter 1, 18 and 25. Matthew's account of the same thing. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be a ch child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Let's just get rid of this issue that I don't like being involved in and I'll just do away with her. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. To take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke from sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. A couple of phrases there in the last verse that this sermon is based upon. Uh, 
the, the message, the word had been given. Holy Spirit's involved and she's pregnant with the hand of God and all this information comes down to these two phrases. He did. He did. And he took. He did what God had said and he took her to be his wife. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit today. We thank you that Jesus did come. But more so than that, Father, we thank you today for working in our lives in such a way that we can leave here with new information. Change people because we sat in the presence of a living God. Do what only you can do today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, teach, and preach your word. In Jesus' name, and all of God's children can say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I already gave you the insight information there for this text. He did and he took. Two words that are action. Action, action, action. God is love. Action. We fear. Action. Dreams are, are inhabited by angels. Action. Today's message is about action. He did and he took. Third sermon in a series titled, I Know What This Is, Another Christmas Season. Here we go. I know what it all is about, Pastor Lynn. What are you going to teach me this year? And as you've learned as we go, this is the third sermon. Last week we learned about the fear. Don't fear this thing, but step into it. Embrace the fear. Don't run from the pain, but embrace the pain. And we'll push that a little bit further today. Randomly celebrated and delivered. No. God doesn't randomly step into your life. God doesn't randomly give his son. God doesn't randomly do anything. There's a method and there's a system. God is a God of system and order. And he has a plan. Many of you sitting here, and I know many of you watching this, do not believe that God actually has a plan, and he wants to work it out, and he wants to bring it to completion, and he will talk to you in a dream, and he will work through the Holy Spirit, and he will. The biggest thing about this whole thing this season, and the, here's where I just love it, is because God, 2,000 years ago, gave us his son, and people think, oh, here came Jesus, we celebrate his birth, he lived and died, rose again, hallelujah, amen, all over, done that, been there. No, he still works in our lives today. He's still moving in people's lives today. He still forgives, he still changes, he still heals, he still raises people from the dead. If you get a chance after church, if you question what I just said, talk to Richard and Charlotte Davison. They know of a man who has just been raised from the dead, who got crushed by a horse, prayed over him as he was dying came back to life. God's still active and moving in our lives today. He's not a dormant God. He's very involved in our lives. So I just wanted to share with you today a couple of points from these two actions. He took and he did. That's not random acts of kindness. That's moved by the Holy Spirit to say, I don't know what's going on here, God, but if she's pregnant with your kid, I'm going to take her as my wife and I'm going to go do as you've called me to do. Now, God got Joseph way out here on a branch. I mean, have you ever been taken to a position where you can't, you're too far out into it, you can't see back, so you only have one option, and that's to go forward. That's where God got Joseph. That's where God wants to get you. He wants to get you out there so far that you can't see the shore anymore. That's a pretty scary place to be, but he has to get you out there so you can't see there. To go back there, you only have one option, is to persevere and push forward through this storm and to step out in faith. That's a scary place to be. That's where he got Joseph to the point where he's like wondering about all this stuff in his head, and that's why I stopped there, because as he considered his human form, it's all the flesh. It's all the questions. And that's what we talked about last week. What are people going to say? Do I have the resources to do it? Is God in this thing? It's all human thoughts and actions going on in our head. And he was so busy that God talked to him in his dream. When you get so consumed with the world, God will get to you in your quiet time. And even if it's minute as can be because you're so wound up, guess what? God still comes and he still talks. And he sat Joseph down and he said, Joe, here's the deal. I know I got you out on a limb. I know you want to get rid of her. 
But I got a different plan. Some of you sitting here today need to hear that. The fact that God's pushing you over here and he says, I got a different plan. Looks a lot different than yours. Can you step out in faith believing that I'm going to take you on a different journey? A life lived in that fear yields failure. If you are unwilling to go out on the limb, if you are unwilling to let God push you out into the middle of the sea where you can't see the shore anymore, that life yields failure. No, I'm not going. I'm just going to get rid of the situation. I'll divorce her quietly, and I'll just be out of the whole thing here, God, because I don't want to deal with this. I asked her to marry me before she was pregnant. And then you come along and get her pregnant, and now you want me to be the dad. No. Some of you live there. That life yields failure. So the first thing I want you to take away today is listen for the change. Listen for the change. Here's God. Are you listening? That's the first thing he wants to do is he wants to get your attention. Are you listening to me? Romans 10, 17. We all know this verse. It's in most of your memory banks. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. So when you come in to worship, you come in ready to hear what God has for you to hear to change in your life. So faith comes from what? Hearing, hearing, say that with me this morning, hearing. Some of you have no hearing. Some of you fail to hear even though you have hearing, but you don't have your hearing aids turned up, which is your spiritual ears. And you come into worship and you're not hearing what God has for you to hear. But you would rather say, God, I don't want to deal with that. Let's just put it away quietly, like Joseph said. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the rhema word of God, through the delivered word of God. God just imparts it right into you. And it's like, oh, did I just hear what I thought I heard? I'm supposed to take her to be my wife? I'm supposed to start a home church in Hankinson? I'm supposed to read my Bible? I'm supposed to walk across the street with a food basket this year because they don't have anything? Simple things like that is what God imparts and he wants you to hear. Listen for the change that God wants to implement in your life. So faith comes from hearing. What's faith got to do with this? What's faith got to do with this? That's the next question. If faith comes from hearing, hearing i gotta have the faith to hear because then it's like oh is this god is it you god how many of you have asked that in your prayer time is this you lord samuel did other people in scripture did is this you lord are you in this thing ask the question so if it's faith comes from hearing he's going to say yes it's me through the rhema delivered word of god hebrews 11 1 what's faith got to do with it Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now, faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hallelujah. Joe, you can't see how this thing's going to turn out. You really have no clue where you're going, what you're doing, what she's going to look like when she's pregnant. You don't have any idea. It's the conviction of things not seen. I'm going to push you a little bit because many people have been taught this verse out of context. Who's the star in this verse? Now, I'm not going to ask you to do freshman English over again. I'll just help you out. The star of this verse is not faith. So many times people have been taught to keep you in fear, to keep you in submission. Well, your prayers weren't answered because you didn't have enough faith. So-and-so didn't happen because your faith wasn't where it should be. Because of this verse. Because they say, now faith is the assurance of the things hoped for. Faith is not the star of the text. It's a supporting actor. The star of this text is hope for. Hoped in the original language is a conviction that what has happened in the past will happen in the future. It's not a wishful thinking. It's not a maybe thinking. It's the real deal. What God did in the past, he'll do again in the future. 
God raised his son from the dead. That's the hope. He'll raise you from the dead too by believing in him. Hope is the star of the text. Faith is a supporting actor. If you have no hope, you don't need faith. Amen? All right, time out. Amen. 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 Thank you, Riley. Take a big breath. All right. I have a tendency to give you too much information before you're awake. So are we awake now? Are we awake now? Yeah. Amen. All right. So, oh, verse is gone. We fell asleep. <laughs> It'll come back. It's not a dream. It's a real deal. Now, if hope is the star, faith is the supporter, and you have no hope, there's no need for faith. Right? Preaching is dialogue, not monologue. So hope is the star. Faith supports the hope. If you don't have hope, there's no need for faith. People have been taught that if it's your, your faith that affects your hope, that's wrong. Because the hope carries the weight. God said, I will bring a son. You're going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. You can't see that, but it's the conviction of the things not seen. Make sense? God has given me an absolute clear, and others here, a vision of what this church will look like somewhere in the future. I don't know how far into the future. We know we'll have a building that looks like a barn. That's the hope of the things not seen. I don't even question that, ever. Because it was given by God through the faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word. My faith is what carries that hope. And listen... If I can get there, which we will, I will walk through, do anything that it takes to get there. Because I, oh, it's gone again. If, because I have the conviction of the hope, which is the assurance that it'll happen. Right? So I, the faith pushes me. If I'm on an airplane to get to the barn and the airplane can't get to the barn, I'll jump out of the airplane. And I'll get in a boat. And I'll take a boat to get me to the barn. And if the boat can't get me to the barn, I'll jump out of the boat. And I'll swim. And I'll get on a motorcycle. And I'll ride a motorcycle to get to the barn. And if the motorcycle quits, I'll get off of the motorcycle because I know in my knower that I have the hope of the things not seen. And if the motorcycle doesn't get me, I'll throw that in the ditch. And I'll walk because I have the hope of the things not seen. But I know that it will happen. Do you have that kind of conviction? That's your second one. You listen for the hope. You listen for the change, but you listen for the hope because God will download this. He says, listen, Joseph, listen to me. I'm going to plant hope in you. The hope is that this girl that you decided to take is the same girl that I chose. She's carrying the Son of God. He just planted hope in his heart, and it was his faith that's going to carry him through. What is your hope this season? God has planted it in there. God has said, this is where you're going. This is what you're going to do. And it's your faith that will get you. You don't question the end result. You don't question that, because God gave it. They didn't question that he was the son of God. You don't even read that in the text anywhere where Mary says, who, this is the son of God? Never heard of him before. You don't hear any of that. That's because they knew for certain that God was in this thing and this was going to happen. Now, let's just flop this over for a minute. If you don't understand the verse that I just taught you and you can't run towards pain and you retreat from pain your whole life, and everybody tells you, well, your faith isn't where it should be. You know what that's called? A dead faith. You know what that worshiping body is called? A dead church. You know what the people above the dead church call it? The church that we want. Because when they can control you with a dead faith, they get to say what happens and who goes where, not the Holy Spirit. Because your faith isn't where it should be. Yet God says that, no, 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 no. It's your hope that I gave you, and your faith is the avenue to get you there. Do you hope this season that God gave us a son? 
we know for certain. Get that in your knower. That hope in the Greek term is concrete, absolutely for sure. We know that he gave, he will support, he will continue to go. When you go fishing, do you throw a line in the water hoping you don't catch a fish? No. You go fishing knowing, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. I put my line in the water, I will catch a fish. Right? And where I'm at in Iowa, we have mud lakes. And the only fish I grew up catching was bullhead. And I moved to Minnesota and they use them for bait. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't even eat those things and we eat them. You ever see a bullhead mounted on the wall? <laughs> Probably not going to happen. No. So when I go fishing in Minnesota or Canada and I put my line in the water, I know I'm catching something other than a bullhead and it's going to be good because I know. I don't go fishing not knowing. perfect example of this is Peter. Peter got sideways with his faith. He couldn't quite see Jesus for who he was. And when he went over here, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to tough this thing out. I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go fishing. And he fished all night. What did he catch? Nothing. God steps on the scene and says, Pete, you have a little problem there? <laughs> Sweating came out of his clothes, Scripture says. And Jesus, I love it because it's politically correct. Put your net on the right side of the boat. And the nets were full. Faith was implemented. Jesus said, Pete did. Net was full. And then John stands up in the boat and says, Hey, it's of the Lord. Look at he's standing up there. Hallelujah. Listen for the hope. We get scared. We want to retreat. We go sideways. We back up. And we never get to live the life God's called us to live. Here's the bottom line of what I just taught you with Hebrews 11.1. 1. Run towards the pain. Walk in the fire. Go head on towards it. You got an issue in your life right now? You know what you want to do? Is I don't want to go there. I'm going backwards today. And Father, I'm, I'm just okay. Stand in my own little messed up, broken world, and I'm going to put this issue off quietly, and I will live over here being me that's broken, busted, disgusted, because I know me. I know my pain, and I know how much it hurts, and I'm okay with that. Because if I go over here and I get out on the end, end of this branch, it's going to bust off. And that's exactly where God wants you. To step out in that faith believing with the hope of the assurance of the things that we know for sure that will happen. Third one I want you to grab onto today is the cost. Listen for the cost. Listen for the hope, listen for the cost. Because we'll get to that point, we step out in the faith believing, I know God's going to do this, I can't afford it. I can't afford to do this. Father, I gave a dowry to Mary's folks, she's mine, and now I've got to put her off. Man, this is costing me a bunch here. And if I go out here, this may, may cost me my job, this may cost me some people in my family, may even cost me my marriage, may even cost me my career. I can't afford to do this, God. Look at Luke 137. For nothing is impossible with God. He told Mary that. I think I got ahead of you, Matt. Luke 137 says, when, when Mary, the angel came to Mary and was talking to her, don't worry. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible when God's in this. Are you afraid that God's not in your life today? Don't raise your hand on that. I mean, we come to this part of the Christmas season celebrating the birth of who? Jesus. And then we wonder whether or not God's in this because if I'm going to embrace pain, as Pastor Lynn says, run towards the pain, what's wrong with the man? Maybe what the people said in Iowa when he left the farm is true. His cheese did slide off his cracker. Who, who runs towards pain? Who, who runs towards a situation that's inflicting emotional hardship? But the only way you grow through it is to run towards it and to let God say, hey, I told you the outcome. I've already secured the future. Now implement faith as your activator, the supporter, to push you through. And yet we get all worried and we get scared and we don't want to do it. God says, I've taken care of it. What did the song just say that we just sang? 
Emmanuel. Where's God? Finish the verse. With us. God has always had a located presence with his people. Came on the scene after the fall. God said, I'll correct it. Seed will come. 42 generations after Abraham, seed came. Jesus, the birth, little baby. The minute his little body hit the earth, guess what happened? Caused pain. People wanted to kill him. While he was still in the cradle. So you, you think for a moment that by confessing to believe in Jesus the Christ, you're going to have an awesome life? No, it's going to be tough. That's why he says, push, and I'll take care. Herod wanted to kill him while he was still a baby. That's the real deal. But the cost has been prayed by Jesus. Because he went all the way through. What was his hope? The Father's going to take care of him. Jesus did what he was called to do. Rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven. He knew he lived by faith. And people who do not have the hope and are not living by faith, listen, listen to their conversations. This is what you'll hear. Maybe. I should probably check out that River of Life Community Church, but maybe not. There's a lot of maybes in their conversations, and there's a lot of ifs. You know, I would go to church, I would read my Bible, if. I would step out and start a home church in Hankinson, if. If are breaks. If are red lights. A lot of maybes, a lot of ifs in those individuals, and they're simply saying, I don't want to do it. I don't want to live through the pain. I don't want to go forward towards the pain. That, that hurts. If I knew I would be better, I maybe do it. Sorry, you don't have that option. Walk in the fire and let God heal it. What if Joseph would have said, you know what, maybe this one isn't for me, God. I picked the wrong girl. You go take her and do your deal. We wouldn't have Joseph in the New Testament. It would be somebody else. And you're sitting here today, somebody here today is probably to be an elder probably to be a deacon, probably to be part of the soundboard. All the places we need positions filled before the 1st of February when we go live with our home churches. All those areas. And you're sitting here today and saying, well, if I knew my schedule. You know your schedule. If I knew that's where God wanted me to be, you know where God wants you to be. So we put the ifs and the maybes in there, and guess what? God's sovereignty doesn't change. He's still God. He's still sovereign. He still loves. He still forgives. He's still working. It doesn't change. So you don't have to worry about his part. Let him get you out there on the branch. Let it snap off. Because I know the hope of the things unseen. And I walk by faith. Your situation has nothing to do with the sovereignty of God. Look at John chapter 3. We're going to get a little ugly right here. Whoever believes in him, whoever has been convicted, does what God commands, confesses to believe, Acts 2.38, repent, believe, and be baptized, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. You believe in him. Hallelujah. He's not condemned. That's why I always ask people when they say, you're going to stand before God and he's going to hold you accountable for every word and action you said. Well, but this verse says, I will not be condemned. God doesn't throw guilt in your face. He's going to ask you one question. Do you believe in my son? And you say, yes. You're in with Jesus, through Jesus. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Next verse. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. Who's the light? Jesus the Christ. Born in a manger. <laughs> light. Hallelujah. Any of you watch Christmas Vacation, you'll know what I was just saying about it. When the light came on, the house was illuminated. Jesus came. The light came into the world. That's what he's saying. The light has come into the world. People who lived in darkness, lo people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's what I'm talking about, folks. I told you it's going to get a little ugly right here. Christians live here. Confessing people who believe in Jesus Christ who will not step out in the hope of the things to come to know that God has a plan for you to willing to let faith be the activator, they would rather stay in the dark because they like their own puke. I'm going to stay here and eat my Cheerios on Monday morning than read the Bible because I like them. 
and your face is going to fall in them and you're going to die there. You love the old you more than you're willing to embrace what God has for you. And when that happens, you stay in the dark because you love your evil ways. Now, if you notice how I worded that, I said Christians, there's a lot of confessing believers that are in the light, but they would rather not be in the light because they want to hang on to their old ways. And listen, that's a tough life. Because they're being convicted daily and they want to go, but they don't want to go. And it causes pain and headache and sorrow. And I need to go to church, but I don't want to go to church. I need to read my Bible, but I don't want to go to the Bible because I like my old me. I like to look in the mirror and say, my life sucks. And they've never been taught that you can live in the hope. Look at this quote from the book called The Alchemist. This is a true statement. Tell your heart that the fear of suffering, the fear, key word, listen to this, the fear of suffering, not the suffering. Tell your heart that the fear of suffering is worse than the suffering itself. And here you go through life living back here, fearing what might happen. And listen, that's what he's saying here. This fear is worse than stepping and embracing the pain. When a mom and dad or a counselor or a pastor or whoever says, this is what's going on in your life, embrace it. Learn from it. Let God heal it and change it. That's what he says. That fear of not doing it is worse than the suffering itself. And that no heart has ever suffered when it goes in search of its dreams. You're here today. You're worshiping in a, in a gymnasium in a church that's been called out by the hand of God. What do we have? We got a dream given by God because every second of the church is a second encounter with God and with eternity. I love that. Pick up a copy of The Alchemist if you like an in-depth reading. Because this is what it's about. He's, he takes people like Joseph and says, he did it. You can do it. You don't have to live in fear any longer. We don't have to love the old way, the, the scared part of us that we're attracted to. But we can step out with the hope of the assurance of the things to come that this kid that God gave was truly the Son of God. This big, Joseph said yes, and guess what? He never went home again. They went and they traveled because of the whole tax situation. Jesus was born. They went to Egypt and they were in Egypt and they came back and life went totally in a different direction than what he thought. And some of you sitting here today, God is saying that to you. I want you to go here in this direction, but you don't have to worry about it because the fear of suffering is worse than the fear, the suffering itself. I wish I could make you believe it. I can't. And this is one of the greatest tensions of anybody who's in the ministry. It's to sit and preach and teach the most powerful gospel known to mankind that this baby came to change your life. He came to die, to wash away your sins, and to present everything to you and to say, go ahead and step out on the branch. Let the branch break off. God's got a plan to hope and let your faith carry you. But I can't make you believe it. You have to believe it through the work of the Holy Spirit. Mary said, I am yours. You know what happened right there? She slipped into the supernatural. She slipped into the supernatural, which all it is is that the natural, the natural meets the super, and you now are living in the supernatural. International Harvester, it's an agriculture tractor manufacturer, some of you know it, some of you may not have a clue, but that's what they do. In the 19, late 40s and early 50s, they marked their tractors with the alphabet, the C, the B, the A, the H, and the M. And they upgraded them, and they put one little simple word on the hood of a tractor, and they couldn't keep them at the dealer. All they added was the word super. You now could get a super H and a super M. And farmers gobbled them up as fast as they could get them. So when the super meets the natural, you now step into the supernatural. And life changes. I don't have to see the future, God, because I'm in the supernatural. 
I don't have to know it, but my faith's going to get me there. I don't have to understand it. You don't ever give me the whole picture, but your faith that you put in me is going to carry me there. She could only stay pregnant so long without people noticing it. You can only stay in the supernatural so long without realizing that dude's different. I know some of you would like to see me ride this. This is a natural. Notice the wheels. Three wheels on the back of a two-wheeled bike. They're there for stability. They're there for security. They're there for comfort. They're there for safety. And this is how we learn. We ride these little teeny bikes with these little teeny wheels, and all of a sudden, your kid's just racing up and down the driveway, and they're like, they got it. And I had a supernatural download for you and for those watching. He simply said, do you remember when your kids learned how to ride a bike? And unfortunately for us, our oldest daughter, I wasn't there. Somebody else taught her. But what do you do? is you take a wrench and you take those wheels off, you throw them aside, and you push them. And that was the word. Don't you ever stop pushing them. I said, but they got to learn it through faith and through the hope of the things to come. But God said, push them. Because they will never graduate from this if you don't push them to step out on the big two-wheeler. The big two-wheeler. Everybody remember the big two-wheeler? The big two-wheeler is when you graduate from the little three-wheeled bike that's full of safety and security, and you can actually start to go with the independence that you get when you get to ride. And you get to feel the air in your face. Ah. <sighs> Isn't that up? awesome? But you have to start with a push to ride in the independence and to say, I'm not going to be there anymore. God's called you today to let the little wheels go and to ride the big wheels. To push you into Hebrews 11 and say, I understand the hope today, God. It's the security. And my faith will take me there. I'm an avid biker. This is one of those commercials you see on TV, don't try this at home. I like to learn to live in the supernatural what God has for me. I have a light on my bike and a blinking tail light. Because many times I ride in the dark in the morning. But when you learn to live in the Spirit, you learn to feel it. You learn to know it. Mary stepped into the supernatural when she said, I'm yours, God. And he says, you are highly favored. So here I am on a paved road. And if you understand a paved road, this is a dramatic illustration. There's a crown in the road. So the water runs off. To the naked eye, the crown's unseen. But there's a crown in the road. It's three and a half inches higher from the outside to the center. So riding a bike, you can actually feel the crown if you're in tune with your bike, if you're in tune with the road. As you creep towards the center, you can feel it. Now, as you go this way, there's these little rivet things on the side, fall asleep strips or fog strips or whatever you want to call them, those little bumps. On a bicycle, they're huge. Car, it goes, bicycle, they're huge. So, here's what you do. You got your bike up to speed, you're going through life, you close your eyes. How far can you go? I've gone almost a half a mile. Because you learn to feel that increase. Oh, can't go over there, so you gradually come back. I mean, gradually. And right when you get to the edge of those bumps, before you even hit them, you can feel it. Okay, just a little bit to the left. Just keep the pace. Oh, going uphill a little bit. 
Drift back to the right. Oh, there's the bump. I honestly think if I could get a road closed so I didn't have to open my eyes about cars, you can ride a long ways because you feel it and you know it. When you start to walk with the Holy Spirit, when God calls you and He says, I want you to embrace the pain, throw away those little training wheels and ride on those two big wheels. That's the process. You'll start to go over here, and God says, no. And you go over here, no. And he'll guide you down the road of life like you've never experienced before. Riding into the unseen because you don't have to see it because he's already secured it. A life lived in the faith and the hope yields a future. Anybody want to ride in the faith and the hope to have a future? We do. Anybody want to ride in the faith and the hope that yields a future? Yes. God has a plan for you and so does the enemy. The enemy wants to take you across the center line and hit you head on. The enemy wants to take you across the rumble strips and hit the grass and flip over. But God says, listen to my spirit, step out in faith and you will stay the course. I gave you my son. We celebrate his birth this season because he came so you can do it. Everybody here from now on cannot leave here and going through your life when you hit the wall this week and you hit the pain, the Holy Spirit's going to say, what did I tell you Sunday through the mouth of Pastor Lynn? I told you to walk towards it. I told you to embrace it. Remember the little bike with the little tiny wheels. Do you know how ridiculous it would be? I tried to ride that thing. I thought if I could at least ride it across here. I couldn't. <laughs> and yet some of you are trying to go through life on that. And you can't. He says, I want you here. And I'm going to push you out. Because I gave you Jesus. And we celebrate his birth this year, this season, so that you can advance and grow and go and say, Hallelujah. I'm walking with Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. I just taught you to let it go and to embrace it. A life lived in faith and hope yields a future. I'm going to do something I haven't done with you before. And because we're a stoic Norwegian Lutheran background, and, you know, we have a hard time even worshiping. But because of that, Karen, you can come on up and play background. I want you to bow your head. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to honestly come before the Lord and say, Father, I, I've rode my whole life with those little training wheels on. And I don't want to do it anymore. I've, I've trusted in the false sense of security of, of my ways, my life, my plan, my deal. And, and those little wheels stay on there. And I, I, I think I got it figured out, but I don't want to do it anymore. And if you're seeing yourself on them little wheels right now, and the only reason I had you bow your heads and close your eyes is because that's who we are. And if God's calling you today to say the wheels are gone, I'm stepping onto the big wheeler. Push me, God. Go ahead and raise your hand. And let the Holy Spirit just take that part of your life away. Father, we come before you today with hearts convicted, hearts changed through the work of the Spirit. Those hands that are in the air and the people who are not. Father, we're all one. We want the best for you, what you have for us. We want to receive it and we're willing to be pushed through the work of the Spirit because we celebrate the birth of Jesus. We thank you for what he's done and he did not come for us to stay still. He came so we could take and that we could do action people. So Father, the people here today and the people watching this, give them the peace and the grace and the mercy and the comfort to take a hold of what you have for them to elevate them and to push them forward. Oh yeah, it's scary. And it may hurt. It may tip over once in a while. But you're right there. 
while we're still dead in our trespasses and sins, you still pick us up. Because Jesus took it all away. Father, let us leave here changed people today, riding with the freedom of the Holy Spirit, hitting us in the face, balancing through life on you. We give you the praise and glory. All of God's children say, I'm letting it go today. I'm letting it go today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.